well, let's go a little bit later, let's say 2000. And you're launching a new application or a new game for computers. You have your experts, you have user experience researchers, you have some people that you found on the street or are playing games and they're testing your new product. Now, do you know if this is going to work, if it's going to be a success or not? No, you do not know. And now let's go to today or after 2010. You have TikTok or this is what I found in Google, what TikTok looks like, Gmail, Instagram. You have hundreds of thousands or millions of users and you are tracking their behavior, their every click, their reaction to every change that you are doing in your interface. So do you know if this product is going to work? If this product will be liked by your customers? And the answer is yes, you know. You know because you are tracking everything. You are tracking all the reactions of all the people that are using are using it. Now, I would like to make a claim that actually tracking and monitoring the user behavior is the biggest competitive advantage that big tech companies are having. Having this different way of building products, making an online interface that is graphical, that is centrally built and distributed to the users, gives companies the flexibility to adjust it to a way that uh, is optimizing their performance. And this is making essentially bigger, more stronger companies. If we discuss what is the, the wealth of Google, of Facebook, of Amazon, uh, of Apple to some degree, a, a big part of it is the tracking, the tracks, the trails of user behavior that they have aggregated the way that they used it to build a better product. And this is making them very competitive, much more than any other new startup that is starting right now. A couple of examples with that is uh, Booking.com and Airbnb. So these companies are quite famous for using A-B testing, of course, additionally to, to the big ones, and they have changed their product uh, quite a lot based on this. Now, I would like to take a short break and ask you how, how does this sound? Is this something that is well known or um, does it make sense? And I cannot see any chat, so. So Anna has mentioned that she has participated in through the chat, she has mentioned she has participated through a pop contest tasting last year. She thinks it's kind of an experiment. It is. In, in, the, in the context of what we're talking, it is an experiment. It is what you would, uh, you would call user research. So you invite people, uh, usually depending on targeting some specific audience, and you are testing different things. You are testing their reactions, and you are testing um, also, sometimes you're testing different things than what people expect that you're testing. Uh, it is quite interesting. You can get uh, some wealth of information. The experts on this domain, they combine elements from psychology and marketing and data. Um, but what I will discuss more today has to do more on the data-centric way. How do we monitor things and how do we decide? So if there's nothing else, I can continue. Now comes the questions about the consent. And I think this, we talk about data protection. Yeah. So I will give an overview now and then we can continue the discussion. So there is, as some of you might know, there's the GDPR. I used to know the word in German, but I apologize. I cannot remember or even pronounce it. Uh, the idea is that there is a global policy, there's a legal framework that is protecting the consumers in the European Union. And this puts some limitations on what the companies can do. So to put it in a, in a short 
sentence. Um, the law is protecting the, cost, the customer, the consumer, and uh, you can always request for a deletion of your data. And you, can, you always have the right to be forgotten. And you can, uh, you have some, the companies have some limitations on how they're using and how they're storing the data. So they're using them in order to build something that is part of their product, yeah? So if they are tracking me and they're tracking my behavior and say Costas did this and that, and there is a legal authority controlling them, they have to prove that they needed to track me in order to provide me the service that they are providing to me. This is the very general framework. We can go more into depth after the presentation. Is there anything else? Okay, I will just continue and we see. Now, let's go a little bit under the hood. What, what is, is it that these companies uh, are doing? The main term that is the, the basis of everything is the A-B testing. Now, what is A-B testing? A is the control, is a control group for scientists, is uh, uh, users that are seeing our product as it always had been. And then the B version is the treatment group, is the group where we're trying something. What could it be? It could be a different image, it could be different colors, it could be a completely different product. Now, this will be a little bit familiar to you. The idea is we're just using hypothesis testing, where the null hypothesis is that trying a different interface doesn't have any effect, um, doesn't increase the conversion of users doesn't increase the income of the of the company the alternative hypothesis is that we do have an effect and how are we doing it we are before running this a b tests we're looking at the sample size that we need how many people do we actually need in order to draw some conclusions and at the end, we're going to statistical significance using the, the p-value and trying to figure out if what we see as an effect is uh, something that we can say with confidence that is, uh, with some confidence that it is caused by our change. Now, this is the, the basic structure, which is common between what scientists do and what a lot of data scientists are doing in the companies that they work for. Most of them work in what is called a growth team or a marketing team and they work with them in order to improve the products that we are all experiencing. Now, just to give you an idea in terms of numbers, the number of A-B tests that run in big companies uh, are about maybe three to 10,000 per year. So we're talking about a lot of experiments going on. Now, this is quite interesting. A conversion rate in the context of an online application or um, yeah, of an online app or something that we are using is the rate of people that actually click on something or buy some service. And here you see something that is quite interesting, just changing the color of a button and uh, the, the font that is used can increase the conversion rate. Now, of course, you can use, you can ask experts, design experts to come up with thoughts and ideas, but having billions of users, you can actually try anything that you like and you will get the answer from the users themselves. Another example, so this is on prescription drugs. I assume it is a in the States, so it's not applicable in, in, in Germany. You have the one case in the control group, you show a very direct message, saving on, on drugs, how much money can you save by going there? And then you try the treatment. You see people that are happy looking, not really clearly saying why. At the end of the day, these people, 400% more, actually clicked on the second banner and made a purchase. So. This, is, this simple methodology can already help 
increase the conversion rate of a company, which means the revenue, which means the profit, and this is a basic application of data science. Now, at the end of the day, going through time and going through thousands of A-B tests and iterations, you could have different interfaces. I have two favorite examples. One is uh, booking.com, where I don't know if you have used it. I assume some of you might have. You go and you try to book something and you get a million pop-ups saying that this is your last opportunity. There is only one left. This is the cheapest possible room that you will ever find. And it is a quite full user experience that they went over time going regularly, making experiments and building it. Now, very quick story. I was uh, speaking with, with uh, some, some people in the industry and they were considering translating all the descriptions of the hotels and, uh, and the places that you can stay. Now that would mean something huge. You need to translate to 100, more than 100 languages, thousands and thousands of descriptions. And before doing this, they actually run an A-B test and they checked if people are reading the descriptions of the places. And they realized that even after replacing the descriptions with gibberish, like random placeholders, the conversion rate was exactly the same. So at the end, it didn't make any sense to spend the money to do the translation after monitoring and knowing the user behavior and saying that, okay, actually people are not reading the text. They just look at the pictures. We don't need to invest in translation. So this is another kind of learning that you can get. Now, going back to booking, you can have an interface that is full of uh, little snippets getting your attention. The other thing that I like to show sometimes is Google. Now, Google started as a quite cluttered interface with help about Google, company info, and so on, and ends up to something quite minimalist, just one simple box. So it is a train that you don't know exactly where it's going to lead the company or, or the product. Now, this was kind of the simplest scenario. What do we do when we have multiple options? We have different interfaces. I said we have four, five ideas what we can present to the users. And keep in mind that the company should still be making money. Of course, we could have experiments and we could distribute all the traffic to all possible solutions, but this is not necessarily optimal. Now we're looking for something that will be a strategy for learning from the users and at the same time making money. Now I will try to translate this experiment to something else. Assuming that you go to a casino and there are a lot of slot machines or one armed bandits and you know that some of them have higher probability of winning. Others have a lower probability of winning. But you don't know which is which, and they all look the same. How do you spend your money? Or how do you know which interface or which bet would you put your money on? Now, the notion this is called a multi-armed bandit and is very commonly used when we go from two or three or four interfaces to many interfaces that we want to see how they perform. An answer to this question is we try to balance. We balance between exploring, learning, and exploiting, making money. The extreme of exploring would be that we give the same number of money to all the slot machines, the same number of users to all solutions, and we try to learn as much as we can. The extreme of exploiting is that we find some interface that somebody liked, and we send all the users there because it's the safest bet. Some of them will still convert. And after these extremes, of course, we follow something that is more in the middle. Uh, in the middle, it, it, there are two 
quite uh, common strategies. One is the epsilon, a part of the traffic going to the current winner, and the epsilon, so the rest is distributed to the rest. So we're trying to learn. And another one that is quite like my personal favorite, it's called Thompson sampling, where the idea is you are randomly distributing your money to the slot machines or your users to the interfaces but every time you do so you are learning a little bit and you will change the probability with which you give money to uh, each slot machine or you send users to uh, every interface now overall this is something that is quite commonly used in uh, bigger companies, advertising companies, for example, Google is using it when you start a campaign, what you normally do, and you want to promote your product, how do they direct traffic? They build this kind of infrastructure. And they are trying to balance between learning and making uh, money for you. I, I try to give you an overview of these two notions. The basic A-B test, which is an expansion of what you already know from the scientific method and from hypothesis testing, and the multi-armed bandits. Any questions, thoughts, anything that we can go over now? There's a comment from Ines, our previous speaker. I think I underestimated the math people have to do that are working in something in media. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. You want to comment something? <laughs> um, there is there is a big uh, a big part of media, uh, the media side, and I would say it is something that after discussing with some people, I, I find it I find it still quite exciting. Google is, is an advertising company and quite a few of the big tech companies are based on this media. And the way that they are making decisions is increasingly uh, data driven. There is a lot of fuss about it and there is a lot of um, pure marketing, but there is always or increasingly a number of scientists, people that some of them started from, from physics or from chemistry or from um, cosmology or astro uh, astronomy and they go to marketing because they can really apply some of the techniques from their fields to uh, make some some sense of the user behavior anything else I will, I will continue then. Now, this is a, I believe this is a Hawaii pizza. So this is a pizza with uh, uh, pineapple and ham and cheese. I don't know who of you likes it. I don't see a lot of reactions. I, I assume there's someone that likes it. I like it, for example. But um, it doesn't mean that it's good for everyone. There are some people that different kinds of pizza, you know, prosciutto, fungi, or margarita. And the question is, why don't we have our interfaces or our internet applications like our pizzas, the way that we like it? Assuming that there is a Amazon made for you, Netflix especially ta tailored for your taste, and Google made for you. And this is a very good idea, which is actually the reality. When you go to any of this, of course, Facebook, Instagram, any of these big applications in terms of content, they are built specifically for you. They do, um, they change the content to make sure that you are the happiest that you can be, not on your personal life, but in terms of pics, and for or, or views in the context of making sure that you will interact as much as possible with the application. Now, how do they do it? 
they do it uh, with using mostly machine learning. The basic algorithm that was used from, I would, I think the 90s also, is the collaborative filtering. They ask, they're trying to put you in some position in a Euclidean space and they say, you are similar to someone else. People with preferences like yours also used to like something else. Um, and they show you a recommendation. And that would be the, the first level, let's say, of recommender systems of this kind of personalization. And now we're moving more into memory, uh, into model-based recommendations, into um, algorithms that are building and uh, let's say they're placing you in a, in a different model that could be um, either a collection of decision trees or of um, deep learning, uh, artificial neural networks, and use them to predict what you would like. Now, we can go more into the technical if you want, but I would like to share with you this, which I find interesting. This is showing that, of course, we are experiencing um, the reality that is the web, but there is no static reality. Everything that we see is tailored for us. And we all live in what is called a filter bubble, a bubble that is filtering anything that we might not like, that we might, that might make us escape uh, this application. Now, this last part wanted to show that the result of the experiment is not only making something globally accepted by everyone or the best optimized product only, but also to build this personalization, to make products tailored to us personally. Um, any questions, any comments, any remarks? Uh, Kostas, I have a question for the filter bubble. So how can you actually escape the bubble if you don't want to always have this personal, like if you just also sometimes want to see something different or being shown something different, how can you escape the bubble? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. So there are a number of things that you can do. Um, the, it depends on the application that you're using. So if you're using a social network, by default, you are placed somewhere. You will, not, you will never be able to experience something objective. If you're using a search engine like Google, they will use all the information that they have uh, about you <laughs> to filter and make the results something that might be interesting for you. Now, there are different steps that you can take to the direction of making it less personalized. It's not fully escaping, but maybe it's a little bit pushing to the corner of the filter bubble. So having signed out of your Google account is a good start. Using the private mode of your browser will maybe uh, help you avoid uh, some of the, of the filter results. Uh, but there is, um, know, for, for better or for worse, there is no universal experience of Google. Just logging in from your IP from uh, Berlin, you will see something different than people that are logging in uh, from different countries will, will see in their first page. So short answer, it's quite difficult. Uh, try to be logged out using the private mode. And if for some reason you just want to get the filtering from, from, the, from, your, um, from your country, that might be likely if you're with a completely new computer that has nothing associated with it. Okay, thank you. you. One question. What would happen if I, if I joined Facebook or Instagram over a Tor browser? Yeah, so Tor is, is a good way to, to try to, to hide yourself, but uh, you would join, and after you join, what would you do? Like, you would have an account that would have some activity, every kind of, of activity 
even assuming that Tor is perfect and nothing uh, will be associated um, uh, with, with, with your IP, uh, you're building a profile in your, with your account. So this will be slowly, it will be adapted to your preferences to whatever you're doing in Facebook uh, or Instagram. Does it make sense? Can you explain briefly what's a Tor browser? If that it is, a, mm -hmm. it is a technique for essentially hiding uh, your, your true identity of not having a permanent uh, identifiable trail on, on the internet, which makes sense generally for some reasons, I guess. Uh, I'm not using one if this is of interest to anyone. Uh, but uh, the moment that you log in to any service, it's over. You are logged in as someone, they already are tracking you by your logged in account. And I only have a couple of people that I know that are very consistently not logging, not logged in to their services and using, using the web or not having a smartphone, obviously, for, for, for the same reasons. A smartphone is a a dream coming true for anyone that wants to track user behavior, uh, especially Android based mm. smartphones. Can I ask something? Sure. Um, so if I'm logged in with a Google account, webmail in my browser, and then I use the other tabs with looking at things, whatever. So Google will get that information as well in the other tabs in Firefox or whatever. If, if Google will be tracking what you're visiting? Um, not necessarily. Okay. It, they might be if they have an agreement with the website that you are visiting. Okay. So but not, not necessarily general. identifying you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, I have, I think I have a couple of more slides. Yeah, uh, and then we can, we can close this and we can continue with the discussion. So yeah, this is not the majority of the researchers in the world right now. Uh, it's, they don't look as, as fancy, they look like that. This is Facebook, they are just monitoring what people are doing. And they're trying to build better products, more personalized. Um, at the end, the web is becoming, on the one hand, more, more global. We have big services that have billions of users and they can optimize their flow, but also much more personal. And I have a couple of references that I can share with you. The first one is on multi-armed bandit, the notion that I described with the slot machines. Um, the second on the, the, the personalization of the web search. The third is a, a generic uh, publication that we did on, uh, on uh, recommender systems that could be interesting. The last one is also one of the, of the seminal papers, uh, mostly following up on the idea that it doesn't really matter how smart your machine learning is after a level, of course, given that you have billions and billions of users. So even if you have your, your dream of building Google on, in your um, garage in, I don't know, Prenzlauerberg or Pankow or wherever, uh, it will be very tricky to outperform a company that already has aggregated all this personal data and knows so much about the users. And I would like to thank the Pint of Science for giving the opportunity for this, for this discussion and super exciting. Thank you all volunteers for helping us. <laughs>